If you have your Bibles on you, please open them to Psalm 5. And the reason why you're seeing my face up here instead of Pastor Albert's is because Pastor Albert is at the men's retreat. So we need to keep him and the guys that are with him in prayer for safe travels back and, of course, protection as the enemy typically attacks after a believer in Christ gets blessed in such a great way. So if you don't have a Bible, need not fret. I think we have someone in the back who might be able to pass them out to you. So if you don't have one, please raise your hand and someone will get you one shortly. But it looks like everyone's supplied, so we're good to go. All right, well, if I, I've had the privilege of teaching psalms in the past. The first psalm I taught was back in Bible college, back in 2008. So you can see I'm really progressing fast through the book of Psalms. Five years later, we're on Psalm 5. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of teaching other uh, parts of Scripture, but a brother came up to me probably maybe a month ago and said, you know, you haven't taught... Psalms for a while. You're going to get back to doing that. And his words convicted me. So I went to Psalm 5 and started studying that. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So just a little background on this particular psalm. We start with the title of it, addressed to the chief musician with flutes, a psalm of David. So obviously David is the author. Um, but there's a little differentiation between the New King James and the Old King James. Uh, the King James Version has the name Niholoth in the place of flutes. And you would conclude that maybe that's another way of saying flutes. But in all actuality, no one really knows what the definition of Niholoth is. And it's the only part of the Bible where you'd actually find that word. And so that remains a mystery in itself. Now we're going to break this thing down in five sections. Section number one, the first three verses is David's call to the Lord. Section 2, we're going to be looking at the character of God. We're going to get a glimpse of that in those verses, in verses 4 through 6. Part 3, we're going to be talking about David's relationship with God in verses 7 and 8. Part 4, the world's relationship with God in verses 9 through 10. And finally, the last section, number 5, verses 11 through 12, the believer's relationship with God. God. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer one more time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great privilege that you've given every man and woman in this room today. Lord, even myself, to hear your word being taught. Lord, we pray that we would allow you to impact us. Lord, we pray that any distraction, any concern, any worry that we might have, Lord, that we would lay it at your feet right now and allow you to speak to us, Lord, that our eyes would be open to the truth of your word. And so, Lord, we thank you again. We praise you. And God, we also want to lift up Pastor Albert and the men that are with him on the retreat right now. We pray that you would bless them greatly. We pray, Lord, for their travel mercies, that they get home safely. Lord, that they be refreshed. And Lord, that any spiritual attack that will likely happen, Lord, we pray for your protection on these men, that they may be used mightily when they return. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, beginning with section 1, verses 1 through 3, the words of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. One thing we need to look at immediately, the very beginning of this psalm, and you see this in other psalms as well, in particular just the psalm ahead of it, Psalm 4, you see David saying, hear me when I call. And we're seeing the same thing here. Give ear to my words. And there's 20 different occasions where you get one or two of those phrases within the book of Psalms. So there is a common theme to that, to the, the writers of these Psalms asking the Lord to hear their words. And we sense some desperation on David's part, especially as we get into the last part of the first verse, considering the word 
meditation. And meditation as we know it would be thinking about something deeply, really going over it, in particular God's Word when we're having our devotion. We really meditate on what God is communicating to us, but it's a little different in this case. Meditation in the Hebrew is hygiek, which means complaining, groaning, being in pain, grief, or having annoyance issues. In other words, you're, you're, you're sort of complaining to God in a sense. You're, you're, you're going through a hard time, and, and David obviously was doing that at this moment. And so we go on, before we actually go on, we go through this a lot as far as our application is concerned with this. I mean, it all applies to us because each and every person goes through some kind of trial. We all go through an instance where we're dealing with something that's bothering us. And so as you take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and as you grow in relationship with Him, you are going to find yourself going to the Lord more often, seeking God more often, especially in times where you're going through some kind of trial. And it's a good thing to do. And it's a good thing to realize that the more you mature in the faith, the more you realize you, you don't have the answers. God has the answers. God is your strength. God is the one who wants to minister to you. And we allow him to do that as we grow. And my example comes from this week, preparing for this particular lesson. Some serious trial with that because my job is pretty demanding in terms of time. And so I don't have a lot of time during the week to really study. And so what I did yesterday was barricade myself in my office at home and just started studying and cut myself off from the rest of the world. And, you know, the Lord is going to do what he's going to do this morning. So um, it's a blessing to, to get the opportunity to share. But there's been trial with that, and I find myself crying out to him, Lord, what do I say? How do, how do you want me to portray this message? And we'll see what he does through the duration of this sermon. So we get into verse 2, and David continues with that same theme. Give heed to the voice of my cry. In other words, give ear to my words, sort of the same thing. Hear me out, God. In this case, now he's talking about the voice of his cry. He's crying out. But what's beautiful here is we see the middle of that verse, how he's addressing the Lord in two different ways. My king and my king. God. He's acknowledging God as his ruler, as his authority figure. And this is interesting considering David, humanly speaking, was the authority figure. He was the king of all Israel. All Israel answered to him. The buck stopped with David. But David knew that God was the ruler, that God had put him in that position, and he'd seen God work through his life. Keep in mind, he was anointed as a boy by the prophet Samuel that came up and said, hey, you're going to be the king of Israel. And I'm sure David had bright eyes at that moment, but he would go through some trials along the way, and he wouldn't rule maybe for another 15, 20 years. He would go through some stuff, and God would allow him to endure certain trials before he'd be ready to be the ruler of Israel. And he obviously recognizes God as his authority figure, as his ruler, and what an awesome thing that would be if we had men and women in this country that would rise up in leadership, that would have God as their authority, as their ruler. Because we've seen rulers, even in this country, in, in ages past, that have been a ruler amongst themselves, that have been a God in their own eyes, and we've seen the problems that have happened during their leadership reigns. So we certainly can use some men and women in this country today that would choose to be ruled by God. And secondly, David acknowledges God as the sole being that's perfect in every way. Awesome, powerful, wonderful, loving, just. Just impressive in every imaginable fathom. And you think of the example given by Louis Giglio. How many of you have seen the, the video, How Great Is Our God? Okay, a couple of you. You guys were no doubt impacted greatly by that. Because I saw that with my wife before we were married, and it, it just floored me. Just getting a biological and an astronomical example of how great God is, how immense the Lord is. We can't even measure you know, God in any way. He's, he's, he's that awesome. He's awesome beyond words. So if you get a chance, I recommend to check that out, How Great Is Our God? 
by Louis Giglio. Talk to me after service. I think I have a copy at home if you're really serious about watching that. I recommend it totally. Now the end of verse 2 on through the end of verse 3, we see David making some I will statements. This is a future tense. This is what he's telling the Lord he's going to do. And I will look up. And he's also saying that he is going to pray. I will pray. I will look up. You will hear from me in the morning. And so he's basically communicating to God, listen, you know, I'm going to do these things. I am going to pray to you. Your voice, my voice is going to be heard by you. It's going to be directed to you. And, you know, he's committing himself to God Almighty and making that expression of, you know, dedication to spending time with the Lord. In this case, he mentions it twice in the morning. So that tells you that's pretty important if it's mentioned twice, especially in the same verse. And so David's communicating, hey, God, I'm seeking. I'm not going to delay on this. I am going to seek you in the morning. And so we see another example, an Old Testament example from Daniel, the prophet, making it his custom in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, where he was going through a trial in his own right. There were some other government officials jealous of him, and they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel. They were trying to nail him with something. And so they made up some silly law that they know Daniel wouldn't follow just so they can get him in trouble with the king. And so Daniel wasn't supposed to seek the Lord. He wasn't supposed to pray. They made a law saying, for so many days you're not allowed to do this, only unto the king or whatever. And so Daniel, you know, isn't going to stop seeking the Lord. He isn't going to stop being a follower of God. And so he goes and seeks the Lord and, you know, it gets into a situation where he gets thrown in the lion's den. God saves him from that and he's glorified through that and, and he works in the king's life. But the important thing is Daniel was a man dedicated to the Lord. And, you know, as a Bible teacher, I'm not suggesting, yes, let's all go and pray to the Lord three times a day. You know, let's go morning, noon, night. I'm not trying to get legalistic with you, but what I'm trying to emphasize to you, the example that David is setting, is the importance of seeking God, of giving Him our best. And David emphasizes that with the morning. He's not going to wait. He's going to seek the Lord in the morning. And that's the time of day for me personally that is best for me, that I can give God my best because I'm at my most awake, especially if I get my eight hours of sleep. You know, I'll be my most alert. I'll be up, make my chocolate milk, get my bagel, get my Bible, and, and spend some time with them. It's a wonderful thing. And also my wife's at work. The house is quiet. The cat's not always quiet, though. So that, that can be a little distraction from time to time. So I make sure she's fed before I even go there. But it's a great time for me to sit at the Lord's feet and just see what He has to say to me. But my wife's a little different. Morning's not the best time for her. You know, morning, she's not exactly the morning person type. So what's best for her is later in the day where she's more focused and where she doesn't have the distractions, where she can seek God as well. So we're not saying, hey, we're mandating that you need to seek the Lord in the morning. Not at all. Whatever time is best for you, but give Him your best. Give Him your focus. Give Him your undivided attention. Whatever time of day that can be, and I know you, know, you probably have busy schedules or you know, families and kids and all those things to juggle. God understands that. But you know what? We need to take at least a few minutes at least a few minutes to give Him our undivided attention, to be in the Word, to wait on Him, to hear from Him. And, and He will bless us in a mighty way. And we see that in the life of David as he is beginning his prayer. Keep in mind, this prayer was called the morning prayer, or this psalm is called either the morning prayer or you know, the psalm of seeking the Lord. And David's obviously doing that from the start. But we're going to start to see some differentiations here as we continue on. Section number 2, verses 4 through 6. The character of God, or at least a glimpse of it. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. So you're hearing some rough stuff right here about what God is not into. 
I mean, obviously, there's going to be judgment that we're going to talk to talk about as we go on. But God, by His nature, doesn't at all like wickedness or take pleasure in it at all. Wickedness is defined as something considered wrong or considered an iniquity, and evil is where wickedness, is, wickedness, wickedness spawns out of. And so you kind of have a synonymous kind of thing going on. Evil is where, you know, wickedness derives from. And so the Lord doesn't delight in wickedness, and He doesn't abide with evil. In other words, evil is not connected with God. It's not part of His nature at all. For that matter, He's totally against it, as you're well aware. Let's go ahead and go to Genesis chapter 6. Turn with me there. We're going to begin with verse 5. We're going back to an early portion of human history where people really started going crazy in terms of not being connected with the Lord and what the results of that lack of connection are. Starting with verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Obviously we're seeing that God is heartbroken over the condition of mankind. You know, everybody had gotten to a point where as it says here in Scripture, that every intent of the thoughts of the heart of man and woman were evil continually. So we're talking about such a depravity, such a state of mind that you're talking about a point of no return when someone is so inundated with evil, they get to that point where no matter what you say about the Lord, you go and talk to Jesus about them, they'll reject that. And and we're going to see another example of that uh, in a few minutes, but it got to the point where they've got to that point of return, a point of no return rather, and you'll see a reference of that in Romans 1. There'll be an insight that the Apostle Paul gives on what the point of no return is. We don't exactly know as people how we get to that point, but that comes from rejecting God for so long. It just gets to the point where they're, they're not turning back. And again, we don't know when that is. But David isn't directly saying it in these verses, but obviously since the Lord has nothing to do with evil whatsoever, he's saying that God is good. And of course, you hear believers say that all the time. Oh, God is good. You know, especially when something happens great, you know, that they notice, that they just shout it out. And it's, it's great to hear that. But I want to read a quote from A.W. Tozer, who wrote The Knowledge of the Holy. And here's a quote from his book. The goodness of God is that which disposes him to be kind, cordial, benevolent, and full of good toward men. He's tender-hearted and of quick sympathy. And his unfailing attitude toward all moral beings is open, frank, and friendly. By his nature, he is inclined to bestow blessedness, and he takes holy pleasure in the happiness of his people. The reason why God has no part of evil and the reason why God is good is because of this word right here. God is holy. And the definition of holy means a moral quality, a good moral quality of being set apart or consecrated, i.e. acceptable to God. And you're thinking, how can a person be holy? Well, it can never happen unless a person comes to a relationship with Jesus Christ because by our nature, men are not good. Women are not good. As people, we don't have a good nature about us. We are of a fallen nature because of our separation with God going back to Adam and Eve. When Eve was deceived and Adam rebelled, that connection with God, that oneness was broken because Adam and Eve could have lived forever. They would have had eternal life. They would never have died if they had stayed true to the Lord or at least Adam making the choice, of course, to rebel and Eve again deceived him. That's, that's a whole other Bible study. But that connection was lost. But then the plan of redemption was put into motion through Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to rise again after the third day, to give us that plan of redemption, that chance 
to receive him as Lord and King because he became that sacrifice that we could never be. To pay that debt we could never pay. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter repeats an Old Testament scripture, Be holy, for I am holy. That's God's call for all humanity. To have relationship with Him. That's what we were made to do. That was our purpose from the get-go, is a relationship with God. And again, holiness, apart from Jesus Christ, is never going to happen. Go back to Psalm 5 again. And now we are in verse 5, where God is talking about, or rather David is talking about the boastful in relationship to the Lord, or the prideful. They shall not stand in the sight of the Lord. And he's also saying that God hates all workers of iniquity. Before we get into that part of the verse, I want to get into Isaiah 14 just for a quick second. And Isaiah documents Lucifer and how Lucifer started getting prideful, saying, I want to be like the Most High, and looking at God and, and, and wanting to be in God's place. And God's like, oh, no, you didn't, and kicked him out. Because God will not be in the presence of evil or wickedness, and pride is in that club. Proverbs 16.18 warns us, pride goes before the destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Pride influences you and me, any and every person, to do what we want to do. So help us, us, regardless of where God stands on it. Pride will tell you, no, we're doing this. I don't care what God says. That leads you into a rebellion against God. It snowballs into full-blown sin as we're about to see in verse 6. Where, even before we get to that, where I think I need to make a point on the end of verse 5 where, where David is saying you hate all workers of iniquity. That basically implies that anybody who chooses to live a sinful life makes himself an enemy of God. You know, God loves each and every person, but God also is a just God. And, you know, it comes down to God cannot be in the presence of sin. And, of course, Jesus Christ made up that difference for us because we are all by nature sinful, but the blood of Jesus Christ covers us because we've come to accept Him as our Lord. And, again, you, you, you see the grace in that. We'll talk more a little bit about grace as, as we go on. But as we get into verse 6, where David is saying, You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. And here we get an indication of God's judgment here. Destroying the Hebrew is avad. means to perish, to bring complete ruin to, or to end a physical existence of something. So the atheist might look at the scripture and say, Hey, you know, it says it right here. Destroy, come to an end, it's all over. Right? Because they, they, they believe that when life comes to an end, you're done. That's it. But the Bible says we are also soul. And the soul does not die. The soul either goes to be with the Lord or somewhere else that we'll get into a little bit later on. But I want to look at the end of verse 6 where the Lord sees the lifestyle that involves bloodthirstiness or murder. And deceit. He, he looks at those things as an abomination, and you have to go back to Exodus 20, where the Lord is giving Moses the Ten Commandments. What are two of those commandments? Verse 13 in that chapter, Thou shalt not murder. Verse 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know, it's interesting how our government is trying to eliminate anything and everything having to do with God. You know, I think the military pledge recently, I think there's a couple of public courthouses, not just a couple, but I'm sure many where they're trying to remove the Ten Commandments. But all these things are great. Don't murder? What's wrong with that? You know, it just goes to show how far off we are as a society, as a culture, from the living God. How far off, as a whole, the world has strayed away from Him. But obviously... Murder and deceit are biggies with the Lord because He, again, makes it 
two of the Ten Commandments, and these commandments are meant to show how far short we fall as a people and how much in need of Jesus Christ that we all are. So we continue on. The next section, David's relationship with God, verses 7 and 8. But as for me, I will come in your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. So David immediately, the top of this verse, is contrasting himself with the element, or rather the world's condition in verses 4 through 6. And he's saying, I will come into your house, you know, I will worship toward your holy temple. Now in reference to holy temple and the Lord's house, you know, there's, I think, three things that they could be making reference to, or David could be making reference to. Number one, keep in mind the Jews had the tabernacle uh, during the Exodus or during the time in the wilderness, the Lord gave the blueprint uh, to Moses to put together the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. The Jews would go there and worship. And again, they had the priesthood of the Levites you know, to represent the Lord to them and to represent the Lord on their behalf. And so, he could be talking about that. He could also be talking about the future temple that Solomon would build. There's a little bit of a story behind that. David one day came up to the prophet Nathan and said, Hey, you know, I want to build the Lord the temple. And Nathan's like, go for it, man. Do it. And then Nathan goes away and the Lord immediately speaks to him and says, no, David cannot because he has blood on his hands, but I have appointed his son to do that. And also tell David that in his offspring, the Messiah will come. And so he told him those things. David was deeply touched, like, who am I that the Messiah would come through me? That the Christ would come through my line? But David anticipated the temple being built because he gathered supplies for his son. By the time his son took rulership of Israel, he had all the material he needed to build the temple. David was that excited to get this thing going. He had the blueprints for his son. All, he, all his son had to do was just have his guys build it. That's pretty much it. But I believe that he's talking about heaven. And I think one of the reasons why I believe this, why David's speaking of this, is because of Acts chapter 7 where where Stephen is basically taking the Sanhedrin to school, taking them to Bible class before they go and stone him. But he, one of the things he was talking about was a temple not being made with hands, not being made with human hands. You know, God's abode is not of anything we can do. So, David, going back to this particular verse in verse 7, talks about the multitude of your mercy, the multitude of God's mercy. And it makes me think of First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34, where David just brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem because it's been away for a while. It's been over, I believe, in the Philistine nation. They captured it, and he got it back after some time. I think it was at the house of uh, an Israelite. I don't know what his name was, but they brought it back. And David, in response to that, said, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. So that makes me think of that verse and you see that he's talking about the multitude of your mercy and mercy in the Hebrew is kased, which is unfailing love, loyal love, devotion, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. And so David's saying we get that in multitude. It's not counted. You cannot count it when you go into the presence of God. And that's a wonderful thing to, to realize that there. When we in our lives go day to day and realize the tender mercies that God has given each and every one of us, that should allow us to draw closer to the Lord, to give thanks to Him and, and really praise Him and seek Him all the more to know that He is working in our lives and giving us those tender mercies each and every day. And in verse 8, David does something really cool too. He reiterates his position from the get-go in relationship with God and his relationship with God. And that position is the position of follower because read with me, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. He's calling on the Lord to lead him. And that's what God should be doing with each and every one of us. We need to allow him to lead us. And sometimes I think like what Peter did when he was a disciple, tried to tell the Lord what's up. And then the Lord would 
kindly rebuke him. But we need to allow the Lord through the Holy Spirit to lead us for those of us that accepted him as Lord and Savior. And so he goes even further. He's now being led by what? God's righteousness. And we talked about righteousness before. Pastor Albert talks about it plenty of times. And that basically it is in a nutshell God's way of living. God's standard of, of right and wrong. Not mine, not yours, His. Living by that. David is talking about that. And he also talks about the reference of his enemies. But lead me in your righteousness because of my enemies? Why would David say that? Why would he attribute living in righteousness to his enemies? Offhand, you're like, what? But you think about some examples in Scripture, and one I can think about clearly is the example of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. This guy followed his uncle when his uncle was called by the Lord, and at some point they went their separate ways. He went to Sodom, his uncle kind of stayed in a region that was safe of all the stuff that his nephew was dealing with. But he went to the area of Sodom. His uncle saved his life on one occasion, rescued him because there was a war between five kings and the nation he was living in. He gets captured. His uncle goes and gets him. And that's an awesome story in that because Abraham was not a soldier. Abraham didn't have really an army. He had a group of maybe clansmen that came with him and they just pitched in together as neighbors and went and got him. It's awesome how God used Abraham and his men amidst well-trained professional soldiers to go and rescue his nephew. And then later on, when things got crazier in Sodom, the Lord would rescue Lot yet again. And that takes us to 2 Peter chapter 2. Turn with me there. And we're going to start with verse 6. Second Peter chapter two verse six. Here's what Peter writes: In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk accordingly to the flesh in the lusts of uncleanness and despise authority. So you got a bunch of fleshly people living in Sodom going absolutely berserk. There's lots of evil. There's lots of mayhem. There's lots of just wickedness going on around Lot. And even when Lot was being rescued, he was dragging his feet being used in that situation. He was used to it. He was comfortable there. That was not a good situation for him to be, but the Lord counted him righteousness. But even though he counted him righteousness, he was already being affected by the people there. His morals were being affected. For example, when he took the shepherds in, not the shepherds, I'm sorry, he took the angels in as just a hospitality gesture. They did that a lot back at that time where they would take strangers in and, and feed them and wash their feet and, and take care of them in their home. But the, the men of the city were so wicked, they knocked on his door saying, bring out those guys so we can have our way with them or rape them. And Lot stands up for him, but even when he does, you scratch your head because he says to him, do not touch these men, they're my guest. And it's a sacred thing with me to keep them safe. But you guys can have my daughters. You can do whatever you want with them. And as a parent, what parent in their right mind would allow even that kind of thought to get into their head? That's how perverse things got there and it was already beginning to affect Lot. And so we go back to Psalm 5 again, we look at that verse where David is talking about being led by the Lord in his righteousness because of his enemies. And I believe it's because 
He was concerned about the corruption of his enemies affecting him. Because David dealt with lots of adversity in his life, and he was really concerned that he might pick up some of the stuff that they were doing and adopt it into, mix it in, so to speak, with the righteousness of the Lord, which is something that's a dangerous thing, and, and we look at it in our lives. We look at the places we work. I mean, I, I work in a dark place. There's people that say things that make your skin crawl. And there's jokes and all sorts of things. It's, it's a dark world we live in. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to be very sensitive to the fact that you know, we are light and we need to allow the Lord's light to shine and not allow those things to affect us. And how important it is for us to be connected with other believers. And you, you know, hear the, the notion of, oh, you've got to attend church, how important it is. That's absolutely true. Because you have to have that connection. You have to have that fellowship with other believers. Not just on Sundays, but look to see what other connection opportunities there are. You know, Pat mentioned an ice cream social. Great opportunity. Connect with other believers. Socialize with them. Have iron sharpen iron. Because we walk in that dark world and there's that risk of allowing that world to affect us. And, you know, I know uh, someone who had told me that well, I'm a believer, but I'm, I'm just going to stay at home. Well, if you do that, you're running a risk of losing that connection. And isolating yourself, the enemy, that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be. Isolate it so we can get to you. Rather than having that connection with the rest of the body of Christ. And that's what we are, folks. The body of Christ. We have different body parts, different functions, different roles. Some of us speak. Some of us do works that others do not see. There's food ministries, there's prayer ministries, there's chair stacking ministries, there's audio ministries, there's Sunday school ministries, there's evangelism ministries, there's so many different things that go on in the body of Christ. How important it is for us to be connected, especially now when things continue to grow dimmer and dimmer in the world today, how important fellowship is. Now we go to verses 9 and 10, our fourth section. The world's relationship with God. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. And you're probably thinking to yourself, why, Rob, did you call it the world's relationship? Because I don't see no relationship. You're absolutely right. There is none. Light does not mix with darkness. Light does not fellowship with darkness. You know, it's a constant battle. You know, again, you've probably been through a situation like I have where someone looks at me like, oh, you don't do things we do. What's wrong with you? There's a guilty feeling. They want others to do what they're doing so they can feel good about what they're doing. Instead of just saying, oh, good for him, that's great. So there is no relationship with the Lord, but you look in that first verse, verse 9 of that section, there is no faithfulness in their mouth, and it makes you think of what Jesus said in Matthew 12 and in Luke 6, where he reiterates, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he had conversations with the Pharisees. You know, Pharisees would try to, you know, outwit Jesus and fail miserably because they didn't realize they were messing with God. But Jesus would make comments of the nature of their rituals or their, I guess you can say, their customs, their traditions. That's the right word I was trying to use about ceremonially washing before you eat. And they were upset that the disciples weren't doing that before they were eating. And Jesus is like, it's not the food that defiles a man. It's not what they eat that defiles. It's the heart. And that is the crux of it right there. Faithfulness in this verse is the implication of firmness, stability, uprightness. So in other words, there's no stability coming out of their mouth. No stability in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Again, the source is the heart of that. And David alludes to the throat being an open tune, or tomb rather, they flatter with their tongue. So he's, he's relating flattery in reference to 
an open tomb. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, he says, those who do wickedness against the covenant shall corrupt with flattery. The definition of flattery, to be smooth, slippery, or deceitful with your speech. And you've probably heard a lot of flattery just this last week, I'm sure, where someone will say something to you and you don't know if it's true, you know, and a lot of things go on at your workplace, for example. Again, you, you see someone brown-nosing the boss. They, they probably don't like the boss, but they'll try to get buddy-buddy with them just to maybe get a promotion or something like that. That's what we're kind of talking about here. So David is equating the flattering tongue with a stinky, open grave. The corruption within and, and how that is in the Lord's eyes. How the Lord sees that. And as believers, we need to always speak the truth. And be discernful how you speak it. You know, I mean, <laughs> don't, don't try to be blunt. Um, try to be sensitive to, to who you're witnessing to if that makes any sense. But we need to be truthful. We, we cannot be saying, oh, well, you know, it's, it's a white lie. A lie's a lie. It can be white, polka dot, purple, pink. It's a lie. And, and, and David's making it clear here, you know, what that leads to. And so we look at verse 10. And David's now connecting the lack of relationship with God with judgment. Pronounce them guilty, O God. You know, through this verse, we see sort of a progression of the downfall of just everyday folk that don't accept the Lord. Okay, they let them fall by their own counsels. In other words, you know, every person seeks advice from somebody. From somebody. But often not, you have this humanistic worldly advice, and, and that's, that's where David's starting right here. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions. In other words, you know, the, the sin nature that they continue to hold on to, the sinful lifestyle, whatever that might be, but rejecting the Lord and continuing to go on the path that they want to go on. You know, when you have a person saying, well, hey, I'm, I'm a Christian, and then they're out, you know, doing things that the Lord doesn't support at all. You see them, you know, in a baseball game, you know, getting drunk and and getting into a fight, and you're kind of thinking, you know, <laughs> you're just thrown back because they made that statement, but they're obviously not living the life. It's, it's like a Christian by culture versus Christian by faith thing. And so it goes back to how we live our lives. It goes back to righteousness, seeking God's way instead of what we think is right. And the source of all that is the very last part of it, rebellion. They've rebelled against you. And that's, that's where it starts. And, you know, someone who goes through their life and has that opportunity, there's always an opportunity for someone to accept the Lord at some point. The gospel is going to get to them. Some way, somehow, we don't know. We know God is faithful. He loves each and every person. And they hear the message of the cross. They hear how Christ came and died on the cross, and rose again to redeem us of our sins. To be that propitiation for our sins, and to, to bridge that gap between us and God, because again, on our own, we couldn't do it. We can't do it. We're imperfect. We're sinful men and women. We need the blood of Jesus Christ. He covers all of that. And so, we see here that this is the result or the judgment of those who do not choose the Lord in their lifetime, do not choose to give their heart to Jesus Christ. Turn with me to Revelation 20. We're going to start with verse 10. And we're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter, which is only a few verses. Revelation 20, beginning with verse 11, or rather verse 10, I apologize. Here's where John starts. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. 
and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Verse 14, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So again, I can't reiterate this enough. To have one's name written in the book of life, there has to be a relationship with Jesus Christ as Jesus being your Lord and Savior. Otherwise, you go back to verse 10, where the devil, the beast, the false prophet, are thrown into the lake of fire, and hell is also thrown in there. So that's eternity of being on fire. And Jesus makes reference to weeping and gnashing of teeth. I can't imagine a continuation of gnashing of teeth. That's how much pain someone is going to have to endure going through that for eternity. So there is one of two choices, either to spend eternity with God or spend eternity apart from Him in Gehenna or the lake of fire. And this does sound like a very harsh thing to say because you don't go to many churches today that talk about judgment. And we at Calvary Chapel don't like to put too much emphasis on one thing. We just teach the Word. We just teach what's in the Bible, what God is saying. We're communicating that with you. And judgment is part of what God does. You know, He loves each and every person and gives us that opportunity to come to choose Him. Just like my wife chose me. It's by the grace of God that she married me. I'm very blessed. I chose my wife. It's a free choice is what I'm trying to say. God isn't going to make you do it. He loves you that much. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to have the best relationship you can possibly have. A relationship with God, with God is better than any other kind of relationship you could ever have in your entire life. And of course, that carries over into eternity as well. Let's go to the last section, starting with verse 11. And this is relationship that believers have with God. The relationship believers have with God. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. So when you come to know the Lord, you have a relationship with the Lord, and you mature in your faith, there should be a response of joy. Because right there in the very get-go of verse 11, those who rejoice put their trust in you. Remember, the relationship with God is trust and obedience. We put our trust in the Lord. We put our faith in the Lord. And in, in, in what He says is absolutely true. And then we see things unfold in our life and it causes us to have joy in Him as we continue to grow in Him. There's three different... Uh, references to joy. There's one word that says rejoice, one that says joy, and one that says joyful. All are mentioned in this one verse, so there's, there's great importance being put on this word. A state of delight, of bliss, of being exceedingly glad, and there's a progression that we see with this as well. It goes from let all those rejoice who put their trust in you to let them ever shout or continuously shout for joy because you defend them. And it goes back to seeing God's hand on your life. Maybe you realized that, oh man, I, I should have been in that wreck. But somehow I wasn't in that wreck. And you see that God had His hand on your life at that moment. Like He does every moment of your life. Because you're not checking out until God is ready for you to check out. No sooner, no later. God's timing is perfect. And then it goes on even further. Let those who also love your name be joyful in you. And my wife isn't here at the moment, so I'm going to pick on her freely a little bit. But, you know, when we got married about a year ago, because we'll be married a year in the beginning of next month. Wow, it goes by so fast. And I'm sure I'm going to be saying that as years go on. It's going to go faster and faster. But she told me around the time we got married, she's like, I love your name. I'm thinking... Fran, that's, that's four letters, 
you know, you get that confused with farm. But, you know, I was like, all right, you know, but it shows her love for me. And, you know, Jerry told me, too, Fram's a cool name to him because the racing association and the, the Fram air, air filter. So I forgot about that. But um, still haven't seen that royalty check yet. But, um, but all things considered, though, what I'm trying to say is that as you grow in your relationship with God, you grow more in love with Jesus Christ. When you say that name, Jesus, it just rolls off your tongue like honey. It's sweet. And that's the point where David's talking about a maturity in a relationship with the Lord. Having a love affair with Jesus Christ. Being in love with Him. And you see that progression. And in verse 12, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. And so, you see here that God's hand continuously is on your life. You know, He's talking about, again, righteousness as according to what God says goes in your life. Seeking the right ways according to Him and, and not on your own foundation. And so, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25-33, through 33, I'm not going to turn there, but Jesus addresses the needs that we all have in life. I mean, we have needs of food, shelter, clothing, and He's basically saying, you know what, I'm going to take care of all that you first need to seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And that's not to say stay at home and, and, and play your Super Nintendo and do nothing else. No, you go and, you know, the Bible says you don't work, you don't eat, you know. Um, but make that your first priority. Seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And so he's saying at the end of that verse, with favor you will... With favor, you will surround him with a shield, as in God doing that action for us. Favor is grace. Unmerited favor is grace. We, we get God's grace in our lives, and we see it more and more as we build up in the Lord, as we grow up in Jesus Christ. The things that he blesses us with that we realize, you know what, I don't deserve this, but, but you, you stop and you thank him and you just praise his holy and mighty name for the work that he's doing in your life. And that, folks, the fruit of a relationship with the Lord is, is, is living a victorious Christian life, living it in joy, even if you, you deal with hardships or hard times. I mean, we have brothers and sisters across the world that are going through really, really hard times. I think Pastor Saeed is still in jail, if I'm not mistaken. We need to pray for that brother, that the joy of the Lord would continue to grow stronger and stronger because he knows where the final destination is at. And that's not to say, again, that you can't enjoy things in this life, but being with God is the ultimate thing. Being in relationship with Him, and that brings us joy. So salvation comes by faith in Jesus Christ, and His grace continues to extend in the life of a believer. And just to hit on the points one last time, you know, we don't know exactly what David went through when he wrote this psalm. We don't know what enemy he was dealing with at the time. Again, he had plenty of those. But the Lord gave him tremendous insight, first, on how to go about seeking God, giving him your first, giving him your best. Second, the holiness of God in terms of where he stands against where the world stands. What the world considers to be right is wrong in God's eyes. And, of course, the world considers wrong what's right in God's eyes. Third, coming to a relationship with God God as opposed to rejecting Him. And finally, the best relationship you can ever have, what that should produce in your life. And so David illustrates that well. And as I alluded to you in this service, you know, God is not just a loving God, He's a just God as well. You know, judgment is coming. Psalm 2 is a picture of God's coming judgment where Christ is going to come back as the conquering king and he's going to judge the nations and that's going to happen right at the end of Revelation and we don't know when the, I'm sorry, tribulation. It's going to come at the end of tribulation. We don't know when tribulation time is going to start but we know it can start at any time. So if you're here this morning, if you are on the fence about whether or not you have a relationship with the Lord or whether you're in right standing with God, get right with Him. Don't wait because tomorrow's not promised to you can't say, oh, I'll wait till next Sunday. You don't know if there's going to be a next Sunday. You don't know if you're going to get hit by a car in the street or 
if anything could happen to you, because again, we just don't know how long God would allow us to be here. But do not wait. Do not wait to take Jesus Christ as your Lord. It's as simple as inviting Him into your heart and saying, Lord, you know, I need you desperately, and I believe in my heart that you are God, and I confess it with my mouth that you are the Christ, and that you rose again, and that you have redeemed the sins of mankind for those who have come to know and love you. So if you want to make that commitment today, come see me after service or see an elder here at the church after service. Do not wait for that. Because you never know again how long the Lord's going to have us here. And I'll tell you what, it's the, the best decision you can ever make in your life. Take it from me. Because I had that battle going on before I accepted the Lord. Oh, I don't know. Because the enemy does that to you. He tries to stop you from doing that. But again, you make that decision, and yeah, you're going to go through trials. That's never going to end. We're not talking about going to heaven immediately, but we are talking about going to heaven. We are talking about being in fellowship with God forever and ever, as you and I were made to be. Let's pray. Heavenly God, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the message that you've given us this morning. We thank you for being in complete control each and every moment of each and every day. And Lord, despite our imperfections, despite of the things that, that we can mess up, Lord, we know, Lord, that you're perfect. We know, Lord, that you guide us and lead us. And, Lord, that you convict us. And, Lord, we pray for that this morning, Lord, that this word would impact us as we leave today. That we would go forward with this week, God, and commit ourselves to you. Allow you, Lord, to be the ruler of our life. Allow you, Lord, to shape our destiny. And Lord, just to lean upon you all the more. We pray for our country, God. We know that we are in desperate trouble because of that lack of relationship with you. Our culture as a whole has just flat out rejected you, God. And we pray that as a church, that we would be agents of change to be that light that you would shine brightly, God. That lies would be impacted around us, God. And we know that you're in complete control of everything. So we give it to you. We don't want to put it on ourselves, God. We just want to be used by you. So, Lord, we pray that you would use us, God. And, Lord, I ask that you bless every man and woman today as they leave this place, as we all leave, Lord, and go about the rest of our day. Lord, may we think about you all the more. And stop and praise you, God, for you are good, despite all the bad things that we can see or stumble upon. Your goodness shines through each and every time. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you again. In Jesus' name.